Um, welcome to this instruction course on lasering technique. Uh, the idea behind uh, putting this uh, in instruction course was that this is a very less commonly discussed thing in routine conferences and a lot of focus is there on retinal imaging and intravitreal injections. But injections are still very much part of our uh, uh, armamentorium. So that's why we thought let's share the lasering technique for different retinal pathologies and especially for people uh, who could not go through routine fellowship in their uh, post-graduation days. For them, I think it will be uh, helpful and we'll try to share only practical tips how to do the laser itself rather than going into details of the retinal pathology. And it's a uh, great uh, pleasure and honor uh, for me and my team, uh, Dr. Parijat, Dr. Shashank and Dr. Ajay to have Dr. Manoharan uh, Shanmugam uh, with us. Uh, he has come all the way from Nepal, uh, Kuala Lumpur. Malaysia. Malaysia, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and he has been trained at London and he, his key areas of interest is in pediatric uh, vitreoretinal surgery. A warm welcome to you, sir. Thank and you. Uh, can we have a round of applause for him? Because, uh, so he'll be speaking on uh, uh, ROP surgeries. Over thank to you, sir. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation uh, and uh, thank you for having me here. It's a very overwhelming, it's a huge conference, much bigger than what we are used to in Malaysia. Uh, so I'm just going to speak about, actually I've loaded up my talk. Manoharan uh, Shanmugam. So it's, it's going to be a, a little bit uh, different from the lasering technique. I know the session is on lasering technique, but it's going to be what happens if the laser fails. So, RP surgeon uh, sitting with us, Professor right, uh, Parijat, he is okay. at RPC Ames and he is doing ROP for more than 15 years. Right. So, perhaps then I'll, I'll, I'll probably need to ask you for some advice later. <laughs> Despite adequate ablation, you still get unfavorable structural outcomes in ROP. So, the cryorop uh, study showed us that. that uh, uh, they improved outcomes from 51% to 31%. And in the ATROP, the early treatment of ROP, uh, this uh, improved further to only 12% of uh, progression. Uh, and this was mainly in the high-risk uh, pre-threshold group at 9%. Uh, conventionally, it was 15.5%. Uh, so the, uh, uh, I just want to discuss a little bit about the indications of uh, ROP surgery. Uh, the aim is obviously to salvage anything. You want to go in before you hit the stage five ROP, and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to go through the stages in detail because I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. And you want to prevent progression, and I'm going to focus a little bit on the non-responders in the uh, ATROP group as well. Uh, of course, if you, if you hit it early enough, you'll be able to maintain undistorted macula, which will be the gold standard, of course. So considering all that, uh, you want to be able to intervene uh, at between a stage 4A and stage 4B, you don't want the fovea to come off, obviously. Just, you've got to think about it similarly to a, a, a normal retinal detachment in an adult. And of course, you want to try and spare the lens, especially if the macula is attached uh, and before the fibrovascular proliferation reaches the lens. So you've got to weigh uh, uh, also if you're going to operate the, the risks of leaving them aphakic versus the risk of getting an iatrogenic break. And nowadays, we've got a new tool in our armament, the anti-VEGF, but uh, I, it's beyond the scope of this talk. I don't have enough time to go into that. Now, just uh, from a pediatric ophthalmology, general ophthalmologist's point of view, predicting who will need surgery, uh, it's basically those babies who post-laser, so you've, you've seen that they've got uh, ROP and the indications for laser are there. At post-laser, at two weeks, if there's any recurrence after regression, or if there's any, especially if there's any ridge elevation of more than six clock hours, if there's still plus of more than two quadrants, if there's any vitreous haze which represents fibrovascular organization within the vitreous, and if there's vitreous hemorrhage, then uh, these are all indications for vitreoretinal surgery or, or, or surgical uh, intervention in these children. Uh, in those who have vitreous hemorrhage, three quarters of them will have an underlying retinal detachment below that blood. Uh, Neovascularization per se uh, is not uh, indicative for surgery, but is surgically a poor prognostic sign uh, for obvious reasons. 
so uh, the, the mainstay is still obviously laser. Uh, you want to be able to try and control the disease with laser. No one wants to operate in these children. Uh, we, we do still do buckles. Uh, Two-thirds of them are still vitrectomies. Uh, we try and do lens sparing. Of course, if, uh, if, the, if you already have tissue up to the lens, then you might have to do a lensectomy uh, with or without a buckle and with or without anti-VEGFs. So as I mentioned, the surgical goal is to try and maintain an undistorted posterior pole, try and catch it before 4B, much uh, similar to a macular on retinal detachment you want to get in, try and preserve the lens. But even if it's a stage 4B or stage 5, sometimes even a year uh, if, if, you know, after they're found, a lot of patients uh, you know, from rural areas or from uh, Indonesia come to see us and you know, they've had it for one or two years, it's still worth trying to do something because sometimes, and I'll go into that in a little bit, uh, sometimes it's, it's uh, if there are stage fives and they're very severe stage fives and sometimes they do get something. And the aim is to try and relieve uh, traction and prevent ROP progression and of course retinal reattachment. So the surgical approach obviously depends on the extent. Uh, 4A is a very wide range. You know, you've got very uh, mild 4As, which is only one or two clock hours, but then there are some that are, uh, you know, five, six, seven clock hours. So you can uh, consider a, a lens sparing vitrectomy or buckle. Most of them lens sparing vitrectomy sometimes. Uh, and that shows in a study by Hartnett that with the, len with the uh, lens sparing vitrectomy, you get less ROP progression and that adding on a buckle sometimes doesn't improve outcomes. Uh, so as I mentioned, a small 4A uh, scleral buckle may be indicated, especially if it's a very uh, localized peripheral RD. And of course, in these children, they've got other comorbidities as well. So uh, you want to avoid repeated GA. So immediate sequential bilateral surgery is an indication. Uh, and the one thing that uh, the picture I put up here is to ensure that you've got a good pediatric uh, anesthetist uh, who knows what they're doing and that makes a huge difference as you can see uh, one of the tips from our anesthetist is that uh, you keep the baby warm so they wrap them up like a mummy and uh, they, they wake up immediately there's no trouble with the uh, anesthesia uh, of course the fellow eye has a similar threat you have to be aware of infections but you have to weigh up the risk of progression of not doing anything and these children not being fit for a GA subsequently uh, over the risk of getting a bilateral endophthalmitis. So the surgical technique is uh, uh, generally we, we go through the pars plicata, uh, ensure that there are no lens or ciliary body attachments before you go in, of course. Do a core vitrectomy, relieve the vector forces. You don't uh, induce a PVD in these cases, and then just a fluid air exchange. Uh, that there's no need, if there's no break, there's no need for an internal uh, subretinal fluid drainage. And this SRF, just be uh, aware that it can take months sometimes to go away. Uh, but if there's no break, then it, it does go away. So the surgical anatomy is very different. If you look at it, uh, these three all look the same, but you know the, the pathophysiology of the detachment can be very different. So you have to remember that the inside the eyeball, the vitreous, is a three-dimensional structure, and there are many vector forces which you need to address. One is intrinsic to the retina, where you, you get the circumferential vector, which causes these radial folds, and might be amenable if, uh, to a buckle if it's very anterior and localized. Uh, and then there are these ridge to lens, as you can see here, uh, uh, which attachments to the mid-peripheral lens, you have to incise these ridge to ridge across the mouth, the, the picture at the bottom, uh, ridge to ciliary body, uh, and ridge to retina. The one, the ridge to retina, sometimes there's intraretinal as well, which is very difficult to, to address. Um, and the disc stock uh, as well, ad sometimes adherent, very adherent, uh, which you need to incise, but just make sure you don't incise the retina, which can be pulled up uh, into the stalk as well. And then, uh, as I mentioned in the stage five, there are stage fives which are very severe, and there are stage fives which they call uh, minimally fibrotic. These tend to do a little bit better. So th you know it's minimally fibrotic if you can uh, see that there's this uh, retrolental membrane which is a bit more translucent, and you can see the underlying retina. Uh, and the absence of anteriorly rotated ciliary processes. So you know that these children do a little bit better. Uh, and, and this is one such case uh, where you can see there is the retina coming up there and B-scan shows you a, a total detachment. Uh, and this child, I think, was uh, about more than a year uh, old. So it's still worth uh, doing the op. So I went in uh, by, manual, by manually and, and just dissected off the, uh, uh, the membranes and you can see the retina uh, right there, 
And if, if you can manage to get, get, like I said, try and relieve as many vector forces as possible. So first you incise the membrane, uh, and if you can, I think I'm missing a picture. If you can get it, then it's, uh, this, is, this is that same child after a few months, actually. So uh, it, it can come back. However, you can see the posterior aspect of the retina is still attached. Uh, so this is worth, uh, I, I don't know, and I, I would get uh, advice from the, our co-instructors whether it's worth going in again uh, to do this after a recurrence. And maybe that's something that we can discuss in a bit as I'm running out of time. So post-operatively, uh, we maintain a prone position, atropinized, if you, there's unilateral aphakia. Just always remember to visually rehabilitate this child, and I've, I work very closely with our pediatric ophthalmologist, uh, and these are the things that we would advise the parents to do. Of course, don't forget the other things because they have other comorbidities. Uh, um, these are very well-known statistics. I'm not going to dwell on them, but obviously the ones with stage 5 don't do as well as those with stage 4A and 4B. Now, the very high rate of complications, uh, up to 50% of iatrogenic breaks, and if you get a break, then there's almost a certain uh, a certainty of failure, cataract and ophthalmitis, apneic spells is one thing to watch out for. Uh, so why would we do this? Uh, this uh, there's uh, late sequelae of myopia, glaucoma, macular heterotropia, retinal breaks. So why operate at all? Well, it, it makes a huge difference to that child. Uh, it preserves the optic nerve for perhaps some future therapy. And it, it's, it's one of the best cost per quality of associated life years improvements that you can give uh, as a society, as socioeconomically, versus the cost of certain blindness to these children, which is 6%. Uh, and you can see here, laser for ROP and cryotherapy for ROP is one of the cheapest things that we can do because it gives them a huge uh, amount of uh, quality of life years, as opposed to treatment for central retinal artery occlusion, which you can see is about $3.9 million uh, because it hardly works, but uh, everyone likes to talk about that. Very few people talk about laser. But uh, I'll just uh, wrap up by saying prevention is always best, uh, and uh, you know you want to laser these children and the study by Anna Els shows us that if you just extend the laser a little bit posterior to the ridge, uh, you reduce the rate of progression from 6% to 2%. Uh, so I would, I would uh, especially since there's a cost on laser, I would uh, advise that you laser a little bit further to the ridge. And especially in cases of APROP, you need to be aware where there are these avascular zones and laser that as well. Just because you see a large vessel there, it doesn't mean that the retina is fully uh, vascularized. And I think I'll just uh, finish there by saying that I'd like to invite you for the APAO, which is in Kuala Lumpur next year, 2021. Uh, I hope to see you there, and uh, I'm sure the uh, coronavirus will be gone by then. Thank you. So those are, that was some, uh, a very good presentation with nice videos and uh, a lot of insight into how stage uh, four and five ROP surgery is done. So uh, I think it was a very nice uh, take on why we should do ROP surgery because you know many people ask, the babies are blind, they don't see. I think it gives a very good navigable. When do you think, uh, uh, in your opinion, that we should stop ROP surgery? I mean, you, keep, you can go on dissecting forever. Yeah. So when, when do you think should be the end point when you, know, you should say, now I've done enough? Yeah, I think, I, I think that's, <laughs> that's something that I would ask you because I think that's something like, uh, that would come from experience. Like it's, it's like how I asked uh, my boss uh, previously, you know, how, no, how do you know how hard to pull an epiranal membrane uh, you know, in a tractional detachment? He said, well, it, you, you get the feel for it. Uh, it's, it's difficult to, to yeah. say. I don't know, what, what would your <laughs> advice be? But I, I would say uh, if, you've, if you think you've released all the traction, then yeah. you've, you've achieved it. But Sometimes if you feel that it's going to be too risky and the, the retina is so thin, I, I would live to fight again uh, and perhaps stage it and come back again later. Uh, but not, not everyone shares my opinion. Uh, um, yeah, and I, some, some people try to dissect from the periphery to the inside and some, yes. like you go from the inside to the outside. So Correct. Uh, do you, so I, do I've you seen Professor Chao in, uh, in China doing the, the outside in approach and he does it amazingly quickly with vertical scissors and I've, I've actually started trying to do that. But I think if, if you can get the trough, uh, if you can get into the trough in the periphery and do it from outside in, then it's, it seems to be a quicker approach, a safer approach. 
but the the inside out is what I was trained with, and and yeah. I'm, so I'm trying to do the outside in as well. So any questions for? Um, Oh yeah, and one, one more tip, when you do the outside in, sometimes it's very handy to, to use iris retractors. So you get enough visualization, that's, that's one tip that I would, uh, that I. Right. Thank you, Dr. Shanmugam. Thank you. I think there are no yes. questions. So I'd like to invite Dr. Dipender V. Singh, who's also the chief instructor of this course, and uh, he'll be talking to us about uh, introduction, choosing right power, lenses, and mode of delivery. So he's been doing this for a long time, and I think uh, there's no one better to talk on this, and he really likes to delve into the actual basics of this thing and I think in high risk cases and shorter in low risk cases single session PRP can also be done if there are no uh, patient is not worry bound there is no nephropathy and in cases where you have you expect a poor patient reliability for follow-ups what are the complications that can happen corneal or lenticular opacification if you keep the spot size too big transient visual loss can happen Photocoagulation of the phobia, how to prevent it, I have already shown you. Macular edema can happen even if there is, there is no DME initially. So you need to tell this to the patient. Hemorrhages can happen while doing the lasers, after the lasers, in between the sittings. Choroidal effusion is more common in patient having a nephropathy. So you should be more judicious and you should um, uh, do PRP in more sittings rather than two or three. Color vision alterations can happen and while visual field defects and night vision problems are common. When to follow up after completing the PRP? At least four to six weeks. Look for the regression of neovascularization. Look for the presence of fibrous tissue, which is a good sign, and there should not be any fresh hemorrhage. So this is how your neovascularization should look like after the lasers. This, if there is a fibrous tissue present, if it starts getting white, then it's a sign that your lasers are working. Follow up treatment, when to do more lasers? When there is a lack of regression by six to eight weeks, when there is active new vessels, when there is a recurrent hemorrhages, or there are skip areas as shown in the previous slides. How to add more lasers? Add in between previous laser marks. Add in further periphery. You can add more centrally also. You can come inside the arcades. Arcades is not a sacrosanct thing. Arcade is just an arbitrary thing. You should be two disc diameters away. Four, uh, favor quadrants with active new vessels. You should add more lasers in the, in the quadrants where there are more active vessels. Scatter lasers in BVRBO. The settings remain the same. Lasers not to be done over the hemorrhages. Like in, shown in this picture, you should never do this. It is a strict no. FFA is desirable before doing the lasers. Lasers are needed only in the ischemic areas to be done between two normal vessels of the quadrant that I will show, and when macular edema is present, anti should be combined with lasers. So this is a case of BRVO. So how to do the lasers? You should see where there is a one competent vessel, and you should do it all in the ischemic areas. As you come closer to the fovea, the laser spot should be reduced in size, and it all, this all ischemic areas has to be covered nicely with the lasers. Can, uh, sir, you can stop me whenever you want me to stop. Okay. Yeah. So scatter lasers in CRVO, wait for hemorrhages to clear again. PRP has to be done like you do in cases of high-risk PDRs. If excess of ultra-wide field imaging is present, then mark out the CNP areas and do it, uh, do the lasers and repeat FFA three months to six months time. When concurrent edema is present, add anti -vagers. Focal and grid lasers, indications nowadays have changed. Earlier it used to be CSME, but now it is non-center involving DME only. For center involving, anti are the best. Non-responding or recurrent macular edema secondary to BRVOs. Setting is reduced, the spot size is maximum 100. Then power and uh, duration you have to titrate according to the marks that you are getting. Focal lasers in DME has to be, tre uh, like treatment has to be done for individual microaneurysms that fill with fluorescein and or leaks. Optional is treatment of microanism, which is less than 200, 125 micron that does not leak with fluorescein. Avoid treatment of nerve fiber layer ret um, retinal hemorrhages and blot hemorrhages greater than 125 microns. How to do the focal lasers? Now again, you have to see where these are leaking, these small microaneurysms or the hemorrhages which are having, uh, which are staining with fluorescein. Just pinpointly laser on these. Try to avoid the hard exudate, just laser the microaneurysms and the hemorrhages which are leaking. So before anti-VEGFs, laser was the only thing and used to work well. 
Nowadays, anti-VEGFs are working much, much better than the laser, so we are not preferring it as the first choice, but in non saturated involving uh, macular edemas, we can still do focal lasers and get very good results. Grid lasers, the settings has to be the same as focal lasers. It is done in the area where there is a diffuse leak and you can't make out the pinpoint leaks. So this is how it has to be done, and again, the spots has to be one bud width apart. So this is another picture showing how to do a grid lasers. You, uh, it has to be sufficiently away from the fovea, at least 500 microns, uh, uh, sorry, 50, 50 microns, and away from the disc. These are another picture showing grid lasers. And the complications, you should not go too close to the fovea in fear of creating foveal burns. Your laser marks will enlarge and can cover the fovea if you are too close to the fovea. If your lasers are hard, they can lead to SRNVMs and CNVMs post lasers. So you should be cautious about this. So sub-threshold, you want me to continue? No, I Shall think I you have to now. Why skip, not? Yeah. So sub-threshold, it take less, some time else. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for a wonderful presentation. And I think you have given a nice <laughs> overview of how to manage PDR patients uh, with laser. So uh, tell me, uh, is your lasering technique or amount of spots you are putting has changed after anti vegfs have been introduced? Or you still go with same? No, sir. Actually, I go. If I'm planning to do a laser in a patient with high-risk PDR, yeah. I will go. I will do the full lasers, full okay. scatter PRP. I will go two to three rows away from the equator. Okay. In the first setting, I will not be very aggressive. I will just make uh, take one bud width apart. But if patient is still worsening, patient is not improving, then I take it further centrally and further away from the equators and add more lasers in between. Okay. Any other question for Dr. Shashank? Sashank, do you combine uh, in all uh, BRU patients with anti vegf you follow with the laser, you treat with laser? anti vegf only in cases of diabetic macular edema center involving. No, I'm not uh, uh, talking about yeah. diabetic. I'm talking about BRU. BRU. No, BRU. Transsetinal vein occlusion. BRV also, if there only edema is present, then I do anti vegf only. Laser, scatter lasers are done only if there is ischemic BRV. Okay, and what about the CRV you all, all patients you do after anti vegf CRV again, if the macular edema is present, then anti vegfs will do. When you stop doing anti vegfs before that you do the angiography, see whether it is ischemic or not. If it is ischemic, I will add scatter PRP, otherwise anti vegfs will be the only thing to do. I think excellent point. Uh, sir has raised a very important question actually. A lot of us has been uh, trained and uh, uh, earlier there was perception that peripheral ischemia contributes to macular edema also. So a lot of people used to do in their practice that laser peripheral ischemia and it will reduce the chances of macular edema coming back. But unfortunately, all the studies who have done this, they couldn't find any additional benefit of doing PRP just for macular edema, the peripheral scatter. And the main reason they gave uh, was that the VEGF production is maximum from the posterior pole and macula. So even if you laser the PRP uh, peripheral area, you only reduce the neovascular complications, but probably doesn't have much impact on macular edema in long term. We have a question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Can I just ask whether you offer patients anti vegf treatment for high risk PDR as a first choice? Because with the modern, you know, DRCR net protocols uh, to preserve the driving vision in the long term, uh, is that an option you give the patient or you still? This is an them? option if there is no vertical fibrovascular proliferation present and if patient can afford indefinite number of anti vegfs I don't do that. I still prefer lasers. For anti uh, for fibrovascular proliferation or high-risk PDI, which has not which is not having DMEs, if the DME is present, I straight away go with the anti vegfs followed by lasers. Okay. So initially, you would do initially a couple of anti if no edema, only lasers. If edema is present, anti vegfs followed by lasers. Thank you. Doctor Ajay Pal, uh, he is a uh, again uh, a very. Uh, gifted with your retinal surgeon. He is practicing at the <laughs> pink city of India, Jaipur. And he'll be speaking on uh, prophylactic laser for predisposing lesions and retinal tears. Dr. Ajay, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, of all the risk factors of uh, RD, we will discuss only the peripheral predisposing retinal lesions in detail. Pemistone degeneration, CHRP, senile pigment degeneration, oral pulse, etc., are all innocuous lesions. 
uh, only thing worth uh, mentioning is that uh, the normal cystoid degeneration at Tora is often confused with lattices and referred for uh, urgent laser. So that's to be taken care of. Uh, white without, without pressure areas and non-cystic retinal tufts are also usually safe. Lattice degeneration is the most common risk factor for development of RD. And whereas the prevalence is high, uh, the lifetime risk of RD in a patient with lattice is only less than 1%. But what makes it important is the fact that approximately 30% of patients with RD have lattice degeneration. There are sharply defined oval areas of uh, retinal thinning with abnormal pigmentation, surface flags, sclerosed vessels with overlying vitreous liquefaction, but with firm uh, vitreoretinal adhesion at the margins and absent ILM. Atrophic hole, holes may occur in 25 to 35% cases and tractional tears in 1 to 2%. They are circumferentially oriented and anterior to equator, uh, but in certain hereditary vitreoretinopathies, they may be radial along the vessels. Uh, if they are only lattices, it's, uh, they can be safely monitored. Lattices with holes may be monitored or they may be lasered if compliance is doubtful. But the, all the lattices in the fellow eye, that is uh, when the other eye has, uh, have had RD, must be treated. Uh, another important lesion is cystic retinal tuft, which is an elevated round lesion composed primarily of glial tissue and has traction from condensed vitreous resulting in horseshoe tears or operculated breaks during PVD. They occur in 5% of eyes and are associated with up to 10% of non-traumatic RDs. Uh, general traction tufts is a thickened zonule with a tuft of glial tissue attached to and pulling on the basal retina and as it may cause oral tears during cataract surgery, pro uh, surgical prophylaxis should be considered. Atrophic holes and operate operculated breaks uh, constitute approximately 90% of all retinal breaks and although the literature is controversial, I prefer lasering at least the larger lesions. Other important risk factors are enclosed oral base, meridional folds, uh, and acquired retinoschisis. Uh, they all should be monitored, but sometimes the retinoschisis may be confused with RD, and in such a case, it's better uh, refer to a retinologist if in doubt. Now, all these lesions, as everyone knows, need urgent laser if possible. Now, understanding PVD is extremely important because it's the link between predisposing lesions and, retina and RD. Uh, it causes formation of tears at the sites of firm vitreous adhesions, especially with lesions like lattices and CRTs, and gives liquefied vitreous access to retinal breaks and thus subretinal space. 10 to 15 percent of patients with acute PVD are found to have retinal tear. Pigment in the anterior vitreous is an important clue to presence of a retinal tear. Presence of vitreous hemorrhage increases the risk of uh, tears being present to 70 degree because vitreous hemorrhage usually results from Evel's retinal vessels. So it's extremely important to closely follow up a case of fresh vitreous hemorrhage of unknown etiology. Uh, for example, this 55 year old lady presented with vitreous hemorrhage without uh, any relevant history. She was asked to follow up after a week, but as the vision improved, she got little careless and returned only after three weeks with RD. So it's very important to be aware of signs and symptoms of acute PVD and to screen for and treat any tears timely before RD develops. Symptoms of acute PVD are sudden onset flutters and flashes. Uh, and presence of a curtain like shadow suggests RD. So if you see a wheezing or a uh, recent vitreous hemorrhage of unknown etiology, you should rule out a tear. Symptomatic retinal break, that is a break in presence of acute PVD, uh, symptoms of acute PVD must be urgently lasered. So all patients with acute PVD with or without retinal breaks uh, must be examined every one to two weeks up to a minimum of six weeks since some retinal breaks appear to develop days or weeks after the onset of symptoms. Now the laser uh, can be done by either using slit lamp or LIO. The advantages and disadvantages have already been covered so I won't uh, go in detail. Uh, laser lenses have also been covered. The only thing I would like to add is that uh, uh, with increasing field of view, the magnification of the spot size also increases. So you have to take that in mind while putting settings. Uh, laser settings have also been discussed. For peripheral lesions, uh, I prefer keeping the spot size to around 200 in initially. And uh, 
one more important thing is that uh, uh, at the same energy level, shorter duration pulses cause less pain and less spread of leisure. So this is possibly the answer of the question raised by one of our, our delegates. <laughs> Uh, like why multi-sport lasers may be causing less spread of laser because they are uh, they use uh, lower duration of uh, that uh, uh, duration of laser, so that's around uh, less than f uh, around 50 microns in the end. And normally we use minimum 100 microns duration. So, uh, but because power is more, effect is same, and that's they use multi-sport in multi-sport lasers because. Uh, you have to give a uh, large number of spots together. Uh, if you uh, give it with uh, more duration, the, there will be too much pain. So to avoid that, uh, they have to come uh, keep duration low. <coughs> so uh, ultimately our aim is to get moderately white laser spots. Uh, we should begin with faint white reaction initially and add, uh, increase as required as an initial faint spots become fairly dense after a few minutes. Too intense white reaction may lead to retinal hemorrhages, vitro retinal traction, causing tractional tears, later more pain, inflammation, and high risk of ERMs, and rarely late CNVM. So we should treat an intense laser spot as a lesion and surround it with low intensity spots. For peripheral tears, it's important to cover interior margin broadly and surround all SRF, or if not possible, then cover telora. Indentation with LIO may help, and we may have to add cryopexy if laser is difficult in presence of media haze. This case shows that a good enough barrier laser can sometimes save an eye from surgery and associated risks. Uh, but for such large tears, it's important to laser till LoRa because tear may spread uh, more anteriorly later because of traction and keep wide margins. Add barrage laser if required, 360 degree barrage, but still explain the possible risks of development of PVR and need for surgery because of RD. 360 degree barrage laser may be required for widespread peripheral lesions uh, it's important to keep it wide enough and uh, centered near equator as two posterior barrage may although limit a potential peripheral RD but won't prevent other possible complications of a large area of detachment uh, that is epimacular membranes, PVR, peripheral ischemia with neuroscolarization, vitreous hemorrhage and even hypotony. Also avoid intense laser spots as they may cause adjacent vitreous traction and ERM formation which may create posterior tears causing RD with PVR and cover anterior margins of peripheral lesions to prevent peripheral RD. Uh, this shows a very grossly insufficient width of barrage laser. Here the barrier is thin at places and the anterior edge of a lattice is uncovered. We can see it superiorly. Uh, barrage laser of such pre-existing large SRF, especially with PVR, must be avoided as it may lead to increase in PVR and even tearing of the lasered marks worsening the condition. Anesthesia, uh, although the uh, procedure is a little painful, but mostly topical anesthesia suffices. Rarely in cases requiring extensive lasers or in an uncooperative adult, we may use, uh, have to use peribulbar. The only disadvantage uh, is that it's sometimes difficult to laser peripheral lesions on street lamp as patient can't move eye in the direction of lesion. Uh, three and nine o'clock periphery areas, that is areas over long ciliary nerves, are most sensitive to pain, so it's always better to laser them in the end and also give milder spots over link, uh, that area to reduce temporary loss of accommodation and anisocoria, although that uh, resolves, uh, results in few months. Keep brightness low to prevent bells, especially while lasering inferiorly, and while doing 360 degree barrage laser on street lamp, better to first deliver individual lesions under topical so that you have cooperation of patients seeing in all direction and cover uh, till periphery and maybe then give peribulbar if required. Sufficient strength is usually achieved by two weeks and if the patient had uh, retinal tears, he should be advised rest for uh, this period. Heavy barrage lasers may rarely lead to choroidal effusion, which needs intensive steroids. And as has already been covered, large areas of intense laser may also lead to vitreous contraction and creation of PVR and new breaks, so we have to keep follow up. And late ERMs may also rarely develop following extensive lasers, and rarely intense laser spots may lead to late CNVM. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ajay, perfectly timed. And uh, you rightly pointed out uh, this accommodation uh, failure after doing laser in the ciliary nerves, especially if you are lasering young patients with predisposing lesions, that can be disturbing. Most of the times it subsides, 
but uh, it, it's a very frequent complaint if you are doing laser for young myopes. Uh, any other question for Dr. Ajay we can take up? Yes, Dr. Raju, please. You are doing a uh, uh, street lamp uh, laser, barrage laser, yeah. especially in young patients. Uh, one thing is the vasovagal attack. We need yes, to be worried. Yes. Yeah, that was important. already so actually discussed, I think. Sir, I was I not there. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. So I prefer to do a LIO with these patients. Yeah. For those people, maybe if the patient is having, you have to be careful. Like, while during laser, I always keep two assistants there on slit lamp for extensive lasers. One is to hold the patient if he starts falling, because that happens suddenly and that patient may fall all together and that's very important. Mm. So if uh, there Anything? are no other questions, we'll invite uh, Professor Parijat Chandra. He is a professor of ophthalmology and taking in charge of ROP unit at RP Center Ames. He'll be speaking on lasering technique for ROP. Dr. Parijat, please. Thank you, Dr. Devendra. So uh, I'll be talking about photo ablation for ROP. So first we need to know when to laser. Right, so ETROP has given us guidelines which have been around for 2003, it's for the test of time, we've been doing it for like 20 years now, and by and large it works very well, zone 1 stage 1 to 3, zone 2 stage 2 to 3, you treat it with plus and you know the disease tends to go away. But with the invent of anti a lot of these indications are changing and laser is now losing its charm in some of the zone 1 diseases. Let's see a few situations where laser might not work and you might try some other treatments before you try in laser. So the pupil is not dilating, there's no need to struggle with laser now. You can possibly go in for an injection first. And once you do that, pupils dilate well, and then you can go ahead and do laser if you want to do it. And also have the rational effect of anti vegf to work for your side. This is how typically a zone one laser would look like, and this has its own limitations like limited visual field, poor macular perfusion, and high risk of uh, you know, myopia. So all this in 2020 uh, might not be a good option with the availability of anti vegfs and in these indications, if you have a case like this, with only this much retina available in ROP, then it's better not to laser these eyes, it's better to inject an anti vegf and let the retina grow. And once it grows to a significant size after anti vegf injection, then possibly in six weeks, eight weeks, you can go ahead and laser this or when the recurrence tends to occur. So these are some of the modified indications of uh, where you would like to do anti vegf instead of laser. Now where should we perform the laser procedure? So we perform in the AIMS and ICU for babies which are inborn and this is a pediatric high dependency unit which is six bedded in ICU at uh, RP center where we perform these procedures. How to laser? It's very important first to take the consent. You have to explain to the parents what's happening to the uh, baby, what's happening to the eyes, the need for follow up, the need for laser, will it get control, will it not get control? All this needs to be very clearly explained to the parents so that they can get the procedure done and continue follow up as well. The baby needs to be warm, it needs to be dry. You can feed the baby one hour before the procedure and dilate half an hour before the procedure and put the drops two times with punctal occlusion. Typically we put this eye drop which I'm showing you here, we, it is made by Rockler Pharmacy. It's also available commercially as well in the name of Tropac P Semi I think. And so it's basically 2.5% phenylephrine and tropicamide 0.5%. This is uh, much less than the commercially available full strength which you use in adults. Both eyes are done in one sitting because these babies are uh, often sick and after one procedure, you know, the baby can get sick and you might not get a chance to do the other eye which can worsen. So better do the, both the procedures in a single sitting. So just to show you how a procedure is being done, you see your proper precautions have to be taken, laser goggles have to be worn and you know, you wear gloves and the child has to be mobilized and uh, this is how typically a procedure uh, for laser would done. So the child is small, you see even though the feet are moving still you can continue the procedure, a bigger child possibly you need to uh, immobilize a little more. Managing pain is very essential when you do these laser procedures because typically we do it under topical anesthesia. The western world likes to do it under GA but many of our anesthetists will not take up a 34, 36 child for GA. So this is what we use at our HDU, it's an injection fentanyl, one microgram per kilogram bolus followed by one microgram per kilogram hour infusion. Uh, we combine with power and topical drops and uh, you can also give dextrose um, and by mouth and paracetamol post-op. But still this is not enough to treat the uh, pain for laser and possibly GA is obviously the best if it can be provided. Where should you laser? This is the avascular retina marked by the green arrow. This is where actually you have to laser because that is where the ischemic stimulus is coming from. You don't laser on the ridge because if you laser the ridge there's a chance you might uh, you know cause a bleeding there or it might further incite further traction and proliferation. This is how typically a regressed ROP would look like. You see the laser marks are not as beautiful as Dr. Shashank has shown. So there you like to give you know uh, one uh, one width apart. Here you like to give semi-confluent type of laser because the more ischemic retina you burn off here, 
the more you know the disease will come under control so you give spots you don't need to give a more a very beautiful kind of thing because the child is moving constantly so you give semi confluent spots and later they also bloom and trying to merge with each other but you will see that the plus disease has gone away and the ridge which was there has gone away so there is no exact number of burns which should be given the idea is to ablate the peripheral retina so you can't say 700 spots 1000 spots it depends on the person who is actually doing the laser skeletal dentition is a very important uh, component of uh, rop laser you need to stabilize the eye rotate the eye and all this is happening uh, because the child is under topical anesthesia the child is constantly moving the eye and this is typically what a shocket uh, depressor uh, looks like it's got a, a bulbous end it's got a taper tip in one end and you can use it to indent the peripheral contrast structures for people who start doing uh, rop laser the typical problem with skeletal dentition is that you know we are used to doing as uh, uh, dr ajay very nicely showed we are used to doing it you know you see the lattice and you laser around it here you see the area you laser around it but you know if you see on the right side photo what i'm trying to show is uh, many times a large strip of area which is marked by the red arrow is uh, left unlasered because you don't see it you see, you laser behind it you laser in the indent area and you don't laser the fold where it is often left behind so in these areas you indent and then you laser on the slope and then you will be able to cover this area laser in aprop poses a lot of challenges because you don't exactly know where to laser so this is to show you a fluorescent angiogram so the newcomer starts to think you know the blue line is where you know they need to laser because that is where it, you can see the blood vessels are there but actually the red area is where you know uh, you need to laser till because you see all the, these are avascular loops so if you don't cover the avascular area here all this disease is not going to go away so you need to be very careful in treating aprop and beware of the false junction so just show you magnified view of the same you see all these false loops are there so you don't need to do an angiography to look at this you can just see it just like this and you realize that the color anterior to it and the behind it is the same so this is all avascular retina and the ridge is much behind another important tip when you start doing laser in cases where the pupil doesn't dilate obviously nowadays you should be trying anti vegf first in pupils which don't dilate but if you want to go ahead and do it with laser you start to give the spots and once you give the spots the pupil will start to dilate so if you can get in a few spots in a pupil which is small and which fails to refuse to dilate uh, by the usual methods once you start the spots you will actually find that the pupil does start to dilate 4 5 mm and you will be able to complete the procedure if not the whole periphery at least the posterior part Posterior barrage laser also is performed in many of these eyes. A lot of people like to do it uh, in avoidance of not to give anti-vegf or to prevent surgery in some manner. So we also like to do it in some of these cases where it's progressing and the disease does tend to go away. It basically has to provide anchorage and deals with some of the posterior uh, uh, areas where. And Dr. Shanmugam also showed some of nice photographs about posterior laser. So this is how we also like to do it, and it uh, works very well in many of these cases. let me show you some things how not to laser so many of uh, the cases which we get are come laser like this so you see uh, these these kind of lasers are of no use because unless you take care of the entire ischemic retina you know all this ridge and everything is not going to go away so you need to go ahead and ablate the entire avascular retina if you really want this disease to go away doing a half hearted job and just doing this much doesn't serve any purpose this photo i like to show often because uh, you know this is a child of a doctor he was very concerned my child might go blind due to uh, uh, you know rop the blue line shows actually where the ridge is and you know the entire retina otherwise has been lasered so th these kind of things happen it's not so rare as we would like it and imagine it to be it happens because people are lasering in uh, tough situations they try to think this is the nasal retina the landmarks are not very clear so you have to be very careful where you go in laser you have to be very clear you can see the blood vessels you can see the ridge you can see the avascular retina and only then you go ahead and laser if you're lasering the posterior retina it's better to keep on looking at the disc and macula again and again so that you don't inadvertently Uh, laser this part so a lot of challenges are there which newcomers encounter so i'll just cover a few of them many of them who people who start doing the laser they find that the media is hazy so once you start doing that basically the problem might be the cornea is getting dry so you have to keep the cornea well lubricated keep the assistant should keep on putting lubricant drops sometimes you press too much newcomers like to you know get to an area where you can't see and you keep on pressing so go to an area where it's easier to see as you keep on indenting the eye will continue to become soft and it will become easier to laser that particular part so don't keep on pressing hard otherwise the cornea will get edematous sometimes you know the optics are dirty you are someone has touched the lens or maybe you have touched the lens and you know now it's dirty in that part you clean that fogging is a huge problem especially people who are wearing spectacles or you know if you've got uh, uh, you're heating up and you're getting sweaty you know it's going to fog so you have to clear off the fogging otherwise you know it's going to happen again and again 
Many times people are stuck with poor laser reaction. So you have to focus a sharp point as previous speakers have very rightly mentioned. You move away, get a sharp point. Many times the cornea is dry, the laser is you know reflecting in abnormal ways. So you get a sharp focus point, then only the laser will come. Many times you're lasering the posterior retina, maybe the laser power has to be tweaked and increased. In the peripheral retina, a lesser power might work in a better manner. And if you are really trying laser and laser reaction is not coming at all, that means that there's a lot of retinal traction there. So you should try and in another area, if it's coming in another area and it's not coming in this area, maybe it's an area of retinal traction and it will not come here even if we try to increase the power. So that makes you aware of that. Many people complain of neck and back pain, so it's a posture problem. So if you're tall, it's better to raise the table height. If you're short, it's better to sit on a stool and you know, rise. The position is very important. People, youngsters I see now like to do it in the sitting position. And obviously you're gonna hear for the long haul, then you have to do yoga. You have to strengthen your neck muscles. You cannot do it, keep on doing this for 20 years and you think you're gonna just do like it was the first day. If you continue to get sweaty and tired, then you have to, you know, have temperature control in that area. Somehow, you know, pediatricians like to fry us up when we try to do laser. So you can, you know, if you're going to do this for two hours, you know, you can't do constantly, you know, sweating and in an abnormal, just I'll take a one minute more. So you can't keep on doing it in a sweaty manner. You have to, can't have a radiant warmer working on your head when you're doing the procedure. Obviously the nursery, they keep the temperature a little higher, but it doesn't mean that they have to put heaters all around you and fry you up. Wear light clothing, keep hydrated. And this is the last slide, laser takes forever. Many newcomers who start, they just continue to do it and it doesn't end, you know. I've been lasering for three hours, the procedure doesn't seem to finish. So the pediatrician also gets, you know, bugged, this guy can't laser, you know, send me someone else to laser this child. So obviously laser training is very essential. You train in adults first and learn the procedure. Media haze I already covered, has to be fixed. And there's a need for speed, you know, the child is moving. You're indenting, the child is moving. There's no need for beautification here. You want to do anyway semi-confluent spots, and if you keep on doing like, you know, at 300 milliseconds or 400 milliseconds, before the next spot comes, the eye is already moved. So, so you have to do it faster. You know, the interpulse duration has to go down, otherwise you can't finish it. And in zone one small pupils, obviously you can think of doing anti vegef first, rather than, you know, struggling with laser and, you know, trying to get only 100 spots in one hour. Try anti vegef first, it might be a better indication in zone one. And if the child is totally uncooperative, maybe you have to fix the pain issues in your ICU. If the child is constantly wriggling with pain, he will not let you do the procedure. And maybe the child is too big for this and you might need GA, which might be a better option in this case than uh, doing under topical anesthesia. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Parijat, for as usual, very uh, useful and uh, crisp uh, talk on the subject. We'll, uh, we are very short of time now, so we'll take up questions in the end. And I'll quickly go through uh, the last presentation of the course. Uh, now you have seen how laser can be used to treat uh, tears, uh, retinopathy of prematurity, diabetic retinopathy. But there is more than that uh, which we can do with laser. And uh, uh, one of the indication is to, uh, we can always laser an extra foveal CNVM. And this was the landmark study, macular photocoagulation study, which actually uh, evaluated the uh, effect of laser on lasering CNVMs. And uh, okay, so uh, uh, this actually study actually told us that uh, lasering may be still a better option than just observation, and we are still following the same guidelines which was given by MPS whenever we have to laser. This is just an example of a young patient who had chronic uh, CSR with the uh, subretinal fibrin related scar and uh, he was complaining persistent blurring of vision which was getting worse. So uh, as you see, once we do an angiography, we realize that probably there was an CNVM at the edge of the scar and uh, there was an option to give anti vegf or, but he couldn't afford even uh, Vastin. And uh, so that that's, this is long back, more than a decade back. So we did laser for this CNVM and you see uh, how do we laser it. They are just confluent, uh, almost overlapping 100 micron burns and you have to extend it onto the normal retina, almost 100 microns. So this is a very old uh, case, but uh, uh, he did well for almost more than a decade, maintained his vision. So where can we use laser to treat CNVMs? One is it will work well for class, uh, classical or type two CNVMs especially if there are extra foveal. And even in current era, whenever even when we are planning to do laser, we always combine it with anti vegf so that it can uh, you know, have a better impact and long-term effect. And uh, the patients who can't take intravitreal injections for one reason, like, like if you have pregnancy or other thing where 
you are hesitant to give in injection and you have an extra foveal CNVM. So that is a situation where you need to know how to laser it. I have already told you need to do go for 100. Rarely you will go for a 200 micron spots. People who have seen uh, TTT era, they know that if you are lasering macular area for CNVMs, uh, better to use long duration and low power uh, spots because you don't want to create a new CNVMs. These eyes are anyway predisposed to get uh, hydrogenic CNVM and important is to extend 100 microns into normal retina also. So this patient almost uh, had very long follow up. Another patient you see he has been treated uh, the CNVM long back and doing very well. Now, uh, and we always do, uh, uh, decide this on the base of angiography. The second situation where, which where uh, we can use laser to treat is polyx. Now I'll just show a couple of cases that why it's still a good option to treat polyps in our practice. Now, this was a 65 year old microbiologist. She has lost one eye central vision by, despite dis uh, repeated injections. And then she started developing polyp related uh, maculopathy in right eye. And as you see, we did an ICG. You can see the nodular polyps coming up nicely here. And uh, so we just did the focal laser and this is the picture five days later. The point I wanted to highlight here was that treatment end point is that you will uh, get a little bleed over that uh, site. So this tells you that poly polyp has been uh, nicely lasered and uh, she did quite well for three years maintaining 2020 vision. And then even when even we confirmed with the repeat ICG that polyp has been nicely regressed and treated you can see a uh, pre and post treatment comparison. So it worked very well for her and then she comes back after three years. We know whenever you are treating CNVM or polyp, they are going to come back in an another area. So again, we did an ICG and we found this cluster of uh, nodular hyperfluorescence. Now this time inferior to fovea, luckily this was still away from fovea. So we did focal laser once again. Now how, how, do, how, did, how do we treat these uh, uh, polyps is just like we treat CNVMs, again 100 micron overlapping burns, but we all, many times uh, also do a test burn just like we used to do in TTT era. And another thing we, uh, we need to realize is to localize the lesion because you are seeing lesion on angiography, but when you are doing a laser, the what you see is the appearance is like a fundus picture. And the same problem you will face when you are lasering central serous retinopathy. So uh, one is you have to look at these landmarks, the distance of the lesion from major blood vessels, fovea and disc. Another good way, uh, many times challenge you find is that your angiography machine and laser machine may not be together. So how to address that? That's a very simple tip. You capture the screenshot of your angiogram on your phone and for beginners, you can actually reverse it because you will see inverted. So then it becomes easier for you and the phone is always handy. You keep it at your laser machine. So you can localize the which area you want to do laser. So we repeated laser for that lady and now almost four years follow up, she is doing well. The another patient which I wanted to show was, again, this was like type one CNVM treated elsewhere with lot of injections and he was not getting better. And then we realized that he is getting few hard exudates here. And we went for an angiogram, realized that there is an extra macular polyp. Now, first time when I did laser, nothing happened. You see the OCT scans, they are almost same pre and post laser. And then we went with higher burn, higher power burns and you see hemorrhage happening. So hemorrhage is a good end point when you are treating uh, atypical lesions like angiomas, polyps, tumors. If you get hemorrhage, this tells you that probably your laser has been adequately delivered and now he is doing quite well after almost two years follow up after this second setting of laser. Similarly, I think well, I'll briefly touch about uh, uh, telangiectasia where again you are treating the abnormal uh, blood vessels. They are tougher lesions to treat. This was a kid we treated uh, long back, almost nine years back. And this is the picture of oral FFA which we can do for these young kids. So uh, you see how it looks like. And another one, See, these lesions are many times very stubborn. So uh, they will not disappear in one or two settings. So you need to have a long term follow up and you have to repeat this laser photocoagulation. Uh, another patient having a quotes like uh, symptoms and we presented in our da like, uh, daily retina forum also where everybody was of opinion that this is atypical quotes only. 
So we did uh, multiple rounds of laser and the point I wanted to show was once you get this kind of bleeding, you know that now this lesion is going to regress. So you see this uh, regresses nicely uh, after just laser, no injections, nothing. And I think this is probably the last case. Uh, you can see uh, this is a young male who came with lot of exudative maculopathy and telangiectatic cluster of uh, vessels here. So now how do you laser it? Uh, what we do in these patients is initially we tend to do a barrage if there is a big lesion with uh, low intensity regular burns and then we treat the lesion with little higher duration uh, more intensity burns and then finally you have to treat the feeder vessel with the highest uh, burns and if you get a bleed that is again a welcome thing you are anyway doing the barrage so even if you get an, a tear that is not a big concern but in our practice we have really seen a tear happening with this kind of laser but as I'll show you that in five years follow up this guy required lot of sittings of laser almost uh, seven sittings and vision is still maintained but the point I want to highlight is they need a very long term follow up this part I think I'll skip this is related to PDT which uh, will take up somewhere else some so post laser care as my colleagues have highlighted that one important thing is that you have to look for corneal uh, abrasions and you have to warn patient about this if they get some uh, symptoms of corneal abrasion they should come back for a checkup so to conclude laser for polyp is just like we do for CNVMs accurate alignment of laser to the treat uh, lesion is very important and uh, long duration low power visible moderate intensity burns are needed for these lesions test burn is always helpful uh, because it will give you the idea how much you can power you can increase safely if you get a post laser bleed that is a welcome endpoint and for atypical lesions, as you have seen, we have 5 years, 8 years, 10 years follow up. So it's important to document their uh, uh, progression. That is how you can make out whether your laser is working or not. Thank you. So if you have any question, we can take up. Otherwise, we'll conclude the session with a concluding remark from Dr. Parijat, please. So I think we learned a lot of tips and tricks uh, from this uh, IC and we thank Dr. Dipender and Dr. Ajay, Dr. Shang, Dr. Shanmugam for being a part of this and I think it was, uh, I think we will go back from this IC learning a lot of basic tips and tricks which maybe some of which we were taught in our college days and some now we learn and go back and it will be useful in our daily day to day practice. So thank you so much for devising such a course and thank you so much for attending it.